if we jump into the pregnancy, is there something additional that we need to think about or is the recommendation actually the same to focus on the real foods, good fats, good protein sources? So I'm really happy to have a wonderful guest today. She's Lily Nichols from the US and um, she is a registered dietitian and nutritionist focusing on prenatal nutrition and nourishment for the baby during breastfeeding and of course also gestational diabetes and I'm so happy that we can talk about that um, in the area of real food. Happy to have you here. Thank you for the invite. So initially we um, focused on the prenatal um, nutrition, the nutrition you need when you want to um, conceive, if you want to get pregnant. And um, we talked about like real foods, good fats, natural fats that come with protein sources and carbohydrates at an, like, a little lesser level than is um, averagely um, recommended. And if we jump into the pregnancy, is there something additional that we need to think about or is the recommendation actually the same to focus on the real foods, good fats, good protein sources? It essentially holds true um, with some caveats, which are there are stages of pregnancy where you may have different symptoms that prevent you from eating the way that you want to eat. So first trimester is a good example. A lot of women get nausea or vomiting or food aversions. And so your you know, intake, um, macronutrient balance, the timing of your meals, the quantity of food that you're able to eat one time, all of those things might shift. Uh, your metabolism is already starting to pick up. Your thyroid is producing like 50% more thyroid hormone by the second trimester. Um, and if you have a lot of nausea and everything is coming back up, even if you want to eat a salad with salmon on it, that might not stay down, go down or stay down. And therefore, um, some women do better having a higher carbohydrate intake during their uh, first trimester than what they are accustomed to, or a higher proportion of their diet coming from carbohydrates, because they might overall be eating less food just because they can't keep much down. Um, but you need to get energy somehow. Um, so in that stage, I focus a little more on a concept I call no naked carbs, which is just to try to match your carbohydrates with a little bit of protein as much as you can tolerate, right? So if the only thing you feel like you can tolerate is sourdough bread, try to have it with some butter and an egg, you know, um, that'll significantly dampen the blood sugar spike. But that is a very unique stage where your body might throw a lot of weird symptoms at you and you have to adapt. Um, second trimester, it, it depends. Sometimes the nausea persists partway through the second trimester, but typically for most, it is at least starting to decrease. And towards the end of the second trimester, often a lot of women are going through like a pretty dramatic growth spurt and the baby's growing faster and you're very hungry. So you might have an increased appetite during that time. Maybe your food aversions have declined and you can eat a more balanced diet. Um, and then by the third trimester, you know, baby is taking up a lot of room in your abdomen and pushing up on your stomach and your lungs. It can be hard to eat as large of a portion as you might typically eat at a meal. So you might naturally go into eating like five or six small meals a day instead of whatever you were doing before, whether that was like two or three or four, you just might need to eat smaller amounts more frequently just <laughs> because there's not enough room. And uh, if you eat too much at one time, it can trigger heartburn or just make you very uncomfortable. So things like that can shift. Um, and certainly, you know, your energy needs are going to increase um, over the course of pregnancy. And of any of the macronutrients, your protein needs do increase, um, especially towards the, the latter half of pregnancy. So as you're in second and third trimester, hopefully any of the aversions have dissipated a little bit. You really want to prioritize getting enough protein at that stage. So a lot of people, um, women who are pregnant, they um, talk about the cravings for salty and sweet foods and then the one second um, the craving is high for chocolate spread, the next second it's for potato chips. What would you recommend? Well, I like to think about cravings um, 
from a, a standpoint of like, what is your body actually asking for? Um, so in some sense, I think responding to cravings or getting curious about what might be driving the cravings is really helpful. Certainly for salt, your salt requirements actually increase during pregnancy. You need more salt. No, it does not contribute to high blood pressure. Preeclampsia actually might help prevent it. Um, so, and particularly if you're eating low carb, your body spills out more electrolytes and loses more sodium. So you do want to definitely listen to the cravings for salt. You might just want to be cautious, like, is your craving for salt being fulfilled via pretzels, which are like white flour, big blood sugar spike, high glycemic food, or could you meet your want for salt from like sauerkraut or olives or salami or super salted cheese or a saltier broth or soup just you know savory real foods instead of always going to salty snack foods for sweets i find those cravings are often related to imbalanced blood sugar and insufficient protein intake so that is usually where i look what did you eat at the meal prior did you not eat enough food have you gotten too hungry so your blood sugar is really low so the physiological signal from your body is to try to bring it back up. So it tells you to eat some carbs. Um, you could think about it from that perspective. It also might literally be a sign that your body might need a little more carbohydrates. I know a lot of women who are previously low carb naturally want to eat more fruit during pregnancy. This is something I noticed with both of my pregnancies. Maybe I needed more carbs. Maybe I needed more potassium or vitamin C um, so I, I would just encourage, you know, filling those sweet cravings with healthier things, you know, whole fruit, um, dark chocolate, those kinds of things, rather than like, whatever, <laughs> whatever candy is, is calling for you. I mean, certainly none of us are perfect. I didn't cut out sugar entirely from my diet during pregnancy. But it's more about, um, you know, day to day trying to make the best of, of the cravings and think about where where could they be coming from and how could I meet these in the healthiest way possible while still satisfying the craving? You know, no need to deprive yourself and be miserable over the course of pregnancy either. You mentioned gestational diabetes and uh, I know many people who haven't heard of that before. Could you please explain what is gestational diabetes and uh, yes, how is it developed during pregnancy and what can we do? Yeah, so gestational diabetes is elevated blood sugar that's either first recognized during pregnancy or first develops during pregnancy. That can mean two different things, by the way, because really any blood sugar issue that's diagnosed during pregnancy is, unless it was a pre-existing thing that you already knew about, it's called and treated as gestational diabetes. That means if you had prediabetes and didn't know about it, You could come into pregnancy already with a level of insulin resistance. You'll have high blood sugar on a blood sugar screen, or maybe you'll have a high A1C in your first trimester, and they'll call it gestational diabetes because any blood sugar, newly diagnosed blood sugar issue that's identified in pregnancy counts as gestational, whether it was 100% triggered by pregnancy or if it was a pre existing issue. Uh, generally speaking, though, your body does become more insulin resistant over the course of a pregnancy, and this is normal and to be expected. Um, if the body is adapting as expected, your body simply produces more insulin. So you're often producing double or triple the amount of insulin at the end of pregnancy than you were pre-pregnancy. This overcomes that insulin resistance and still maintains uh, normal blood sugar levels. And blood sugar levels do actually trend slightly lower than non-pregnancy levels. Um, this is an important uh, distinction because some people try to normalize high blood sugar in pregnancy. Oh, well, oh, you're just more insulin resistant. And so it's normal. It's actually not normal. It's normal for your body to overcome the insulin resistance with a sufficient amount of insulin to still keep your blood sugars quite low. Um, there are a lot of factors, of course, that can play a role in this, like a family history of type 2 diabetes um, if your mom had gestational diabetes when she was pregnant with you, um, if you're coming into pregnancy already with insulin resistance, maybe coming pregnancy at like a higher BMI or with PCOS or some other 
factor that's associated with insulin resistance. Um, these are all, all potential things that can play a role. And then I think for the most part, you know, in, in rare instances, it's like a sudden thing that only develops during pregnancy and then goes away. Most of the time, we're, from what I've seen since we screen in the first trimester with the hemoglobin A1C, most of the time, what I see is pre-existing, pre-diabetes that was already going on pre-pregnancy. It's just magnified and identified during pregnancy. Um, and that's why there's such a high incidence of developing type 2 diabetes after a gestational diabetes pregnancy, because there's some underlying insulin resistance. You can do things, of course, after the fact to help reduce your chances of developing type 2 later on. Um, but the data is that anywhere from 30 to 70% of women with gestational diabetes will go on to develop type 2 diabetes. So it's like the number one predictive risk factor in women specifically. So it's like warning light has come on in your car. <laughs> you want to be prioritizing blood sugar balance lifelong, even if you're not testing your blood sugar constantly when you're not pregnant anymore. It's something to keep an eye on um, and something to you know consider. What did you do during pregnancy that helped to manage your blood sugar? What do you do nutritionally, lifestyle-wise? Those are the same things that you'll want to do long-term so that it you know, isn't an issue. Yeah, sure. So if we talk about blood sugar balance, uh, we talk about reducing the overall amount of carbs and choosing slower carbs, but also about like the combination of meals. An apple, which I eat separately from other uh, micronutrients, has a different impact than an apple I eat with some fat and with some protein because it has a lesser um, impact on insulin and glucose levels. Would you um, say so as well? 100% agree. Yeah. So fat, protein, and fiber, um, I'd add to that even like acidic foods. Um, those things all help to blunt uh, blood sugar and insulin response to a meal. So an apple eaten with a piece of cheese or with some peanut butter is much better for your blood sugar levels. You won't spike and crash as much as an apple um, that, you know, you eat by itself. Like it, it, it matters what you pair it with. Likewise, the overall balance on your plate. Um, I think some people think like, oh, well, fat and protein will like cancel out the carbohydrates of the meal. And that's not entirely true. You'll, you'll have a lesser blood sugar response if you have protein and fat and fiber also at the meal. But if you're still having a massive portion of carbohydrates, or maybe, maybe massive is a wrong word, a, <laughs> a slightly bigger portion of carbohydrates because it's is less than people think that can trigger a pretty big blood sugar response. Um, if you're, if you're having like what would be probably a typical portion of pasta or potatoes, it doesn't really matter if it's paired with lots of protein and fat, you'll still have a really big blood sugar spike. So you want to like overall think about slightly smaller portions of your carbohydrate rich foods, like your potatoes and starchy foods, pastas and whatnot. And have a larger portion of your plate from those lower carb vegetables, your proteins and fat. That will give you like a slight rise in blood sugar and it'll kind of come down slowly over time rather than a bigger curve. And that's really what you're trying to avoid with gestational diabetes is a big post-meal blood sugar spike. That's, that's one of the number one indicators of uh, predictors of um, you know, complications with mother or baby related to gestational diabetes is big post-meal spikes. And there actually is data on pregnancy using CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, even in women without gestational diabetes, that when they assign them to a low glycemic index diet, so the so-called slow carbs that you're talking about, their blood sugar variability is 50% lower than the ones on the high glycemic plan, even though the carb intake is roughly the same. Likewise, we have other data showing that a low glycemic index meal plan reduces the chances that a woman will require insulin to treat gestational diabetes by about 50%. Because if you're not overburdening your pancreas to produce tons and tons of insulin that it can't keep up with, then yes, you're less likely to require medication to do that job for you. You can just reduce the blood sugar spikes and reduce the demand on your insulin production. If there would only be three recommendations you could give to pregnant women, what 
would be these top three recommendations? Oh, it's tricky because I could go into a lot of things. So I would say um, sufficient protein. Over time, my guidelines are my discussion on pregnancy nutrition has really shifted a lot towards prioritizing protein because that naturally usually ends up reducing the cravings and the intake of starchy refined high glycemic carbohydrates because your blood sugar is more balanced. So certainly start with sufficient protein. Um, don't fear fat and better quality carbohydrates. I would add um, some other three as well. I would say like cut out sweet drinks altogether, like cut out the apple juice and cut out the soft drinks. Then I might um, also go like for the protein, combine every meal with a little portion of protein to have yeah. less um, carb cravings and more satiety. And for the sad third one, I would say eat the yolks. So yes. I guess we have six nice points that people could, I would agree with could include. Those. So now the baby is there, um, the mom is breastfeeding. What should she eat to nourish the baby best and nourish herself best? So like I said, there's a lot of crossover with all of these different stages. For postpartum specifically, your nutrient demands are the highest of all. Highest for protein, highest for calories, highest for micronutrients more so than the third trimester of pregnancy. And yet this is a time where most women are more preoccupied, maybe from societal or family or friend pressure to just drop the weight as quickly as possible. And this is actually the, the wrong thing to focus on. Um, in fact, eating more food and eating more nutrient dense food will over the long term much better support your recovery. And yes, you will lose the weight, but it might not be immediately and that's okay. This is a time where you need a lot of nourishment. And I mean like a lot, depending on how your birth went down. It's a very um, energy expending process. If you gave birth you know, physiologically, um, vaginal birth, and you had like very long labor, for example, that's like the equivalent to running a marathon. Maybe you had a cesarean section. So now you had major abdominal surgery and like a major wound that needs to heal. Um, or maybe you had an emergency C-section where you got both the marathon and abdominal surgery. Any way you slice it, the nutrient demands are very high in your body for recovery, especially those first two weeks. You might find yourself hungry for double, triple, quadruple portions, um, especially for protein-rich foods. And so you really want to go heavy, heavy, heavy on the protein. Um, the only study that we have looking specifically at protein requirements postpartum was done at three to six months postpartum in breastfeeding women. And they required the protein needs of an athlete. And that's at three to six months. That's when most of your recovery, like major physiological recovery and remodeling of the uterus, healing of any surgical wounds or tears or anything, that's all taken place. Your milk has come in, hormones have kind of leveled out a little bit. And still at three to six months, the protein demands are very high. So I cannot underemphasize the importance of eating more food, eating more protein, eating more fat, you actually probably might need to eat more carbs too for a period of time, simply because your energy demands are so high that it might not be um, proportionally you're eating more carbohydrates, like they're still in balance to your protein and fat intake, but gram wise, it very likely may be higher. So don't fear that your appetite and energy needs will come down over time. Um, typically after the period of exclusive breastfeeding, is complete and, and as baby transitions to more solid foods and is nursing less, this can vary baby to baby, but your nutrient demands will slowly taper off um, over time. So that's, I mean, it, it sort of is the same conversation as always just for different reasons, but I, I'd say the, the big, big one is that protein without taking the fat out of it, of course. A lot of women complain of being crazy hungry and getting insane cravings and needing to like raid the pantry to eat whatever they can because they're so hungry. When they're breastfeeding, you're burning like 500 additional calories per day just to produce milk. 
and then add on the sleep deprivation and all that on top of it. But if you consume enough protein, you'll much better stabilize your blood sugar levels so you won't crash as often and then won't have those insatiable cravings for carbohydrates and, and quick foods. Um, the challenge with a baby is that you're, you don't have the time, energy, physical strength, wherewithal to be cooking food all the time. And this is a time where traditionally, at least outside of Western cultures, there was a very big emphasis on supporting new mothers. Um, so oftentimes it was older female relatives, like your mother, mother-in-law, aunts, um, that would prepare food for you and like take care of you. So you could just rest and recover and nurse your baby and, and not be burdened with thinking about all of those things. And that is um, uh, a challenge to recreate that in you know, our modern culture, but it probably needs to happen. Um, the whole last chapter of Real Food for Pregnancy is all about uh, postpartum recovery and breastfeeding nutrition. I also have a blog post that goes through like 50 plus real food postpartum recovery meals, um, links out to recipes and gives you some rationale. I wanted to have like a separate resource, not in a book that's like freely available to everybody because I think it's so, so, so vital that we prepare new mothers for the really intense energy and nutritional demands of postpartum. And it can dramatically change your quality of life, mental health, um, everything, um, if, if you're properly nourished during that time. There is a saying that it takes a village to raise a kid. So uh, for all non-pregnant women and men out there, maybe it's a good idea to support the moms, the newly um, moms, uh, with some cooking and some support because they have yes. so much work already. So that's something good you could do. Bring them a meal, make a delicious stew, make a soup, make a casserole, something very protein dense, bring a big, uh, big quiche that they can reheat. Um, bring food. Don't just come over to see the baby and hold the baby. Babies want to be in mom's arms anyways. Bring food, do her dishes, and then leave idea. within 30 minutes to an hour unless she really wants the company at that time. You, you really need a lot of rest and nourishment postpartum. Yeah. There's one thing you said that really stuck to my mind. It is when you mentioned that the nourishment I have during pregnancy impacts the child and the nourishment of the child even up to eight years after birth. This is huge and I didn't know about that. So no matter what the child eats, you have such a huge impact on the development of this little body and uh, this newly born, born child. Yeah, and there are, there are so many other examples of that effect. We call it epigenetics, like how the genetics of, of a baby, the expression of their genes can impact their, the rest of their life, their future risk of disease, their future brain health. The blood sugar thing is, is another one. You know, mothers who have elevated blood sugar throughout pregnancy, their babies face anywhere from a six to 19 fold increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, often by the time they're teenagers, by the way. So their metabolism is programmed in utero. So if you have well balanced blood sugar, and your metabolism is functioning well, and you're not overburdening your body with so many refined carbohydrates and sugars that it has to produce so much insulin, that impacts their metabolic health, that impacts their pancreas, their insulin resistance, their risk of disease later in life. It's huge. It cannot be understated how important this is. And some of these effects we know can last generations. You can interrupt that in your generation if something went awry, you know, during your mother's pregnancy with you, you can interrupt that with better nutrition and, and change, you know, the, the genetic um, expression in your, in your baby. It doesn't mean you're going to change the genetics, but in terms of thinking about disease or risk of disease as being hereditary, um, it would, it would lessen the impact of whatever the negative, like, say there's a risk for type 2 diabetes in your family. You could lessen the risk for that, even though the baby has the same genetics. It's the expression of the genes that can impact that. I have three more community questions that I would like to ask you. And the first one is about ketogenic diet. What is your opinion on keto diet during breastfeeding? So it depends what stage you are in breastfeeding. 
And it would depend if your body is already like keto adapted, right? Have you been mostly keto during your pregnancy and your body can very easily use those fuels without problem? Um, then I, then I don't think it's necessarily contraindicated. What I would say is just to exercise a little bit of caution because in, especially in early postpartum, the first couple months when your uh, milk supply is becoming established, you're recovering and your energy needs are so high. You know, a ketogenic diet makes you meta more metabolically efficient. You burn more calories, but you're in a situation where you're already burning a lot of calories. Do you really need to be doing a ketogenic diet right now? Um, moreover, could there be any gaps in your diet if you're very strictly keto, such as some of your electrolytes, especially like potassium? And are you replacing your sodium um, enough? You do lose a lot of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, other minerals in your milk. So if you're noticing any issues with supply or baby's really fussy or you feel very dehydrated or feel very constipated or have headaches or um, leg cramps, those types of things, I might think about titrating up your carbs a little bit. And that could just be from, you know, healthy whole foods that are electrolyte rich, like your whole fruits and, uh, uh, you know, root vegetables, um, winter squash, those types of foods. Um, and you don't have to go like, absolutely hog wild on the carbs. I certainly was relatively low carb while nursing, but there are some anecdotal stories of um, lower milk supply and challenges like establishing your milk supply um, in women who are very strictly uh, ketogenic. So I usually recommend not going below 50 grams of carbs per day. And arguably, I think most women do better at like 100, 150, maybe 200 or more grams of carbs in early breastfeeding. It really depends on their activity and metabolism and all of those factors. Um, and wait until your milk supply is really well established. And then if you want to, you know, experiment with going lower carb, then just very gradually titrate down. Don't go from like 200 grams a day down to like 20 grams of carbs a day. That's, that creates, a, you know, significant stress on your body. And when your body is under stress, you produce less prolactin and that's required for breast milk production. So think of, you know, where you kind of want to pull the levers metabolically and what stresses you're incurring, because it, it is a very stressful period of your life. And if being very, very low carb keto is causing an additional stress and is reducing your prolactin levels, then it might be a mismatch for this stage. At the same time, I know women who were keto during their pregnancy, keto postpartum, had no problems nursing whatsoever. Their body was really well adapted to that way of eating. So I don't ever say a blanket, don't do that. I just add a couple cautions on hydration, electrolytes, sort of titrating slowly, and then watching your supply because everybody's um, experience with breastfeeding and, and milk supply is, is very individual. What else can I do to support milk supply in terms of which kind of foods should I eat? So the biggest thing with milk supply, um, you know, yes, nutrition and sufficient hydration and electrolytes are, are important from a nutritional perspective, but the like mechanics and physiology of nursing and, and mother infant connection um, cannot be understated. So if you have a lactation consultant or lactation educator available, um, they can really help to troubleshoot some of this stuff. So there's many, many possible things. If baby is not extracting milk efficiently from your breasts, they do not get the signal to keep producing that same volume of milk. In fact, it's a negative feedback. The less milk that's transferred, the less milk your body produces. So if there's any issues with a latch or tongue tie or not offering the breast often enough, um, being separated from baby overnight because your prolactin levels are highest at night. So nursing at night is actually very important for maintaining your uh, milk supply, by the way. If you are separated from baby, are you pumping at the same intervals as you would when you're nursing with baby? Um, also understanding that transfer of milk to baby directly is always higher than whatever pump output is showing you. Because again, it's that very delicate hormonal balance and, and physiological connection there 
that really does influence um, milk transfer. But I, I would be looking at all of those other factors in addition to just the food part, because you know, at the end of the day, it's optimal to have like sufficient food and nutrition and hydration and electrolytes, like you'll have a better quality of life and arguably that can, you know, support your milk supply. But we also have scenarios of women in absolutely like terrible situations with limited access to food and they're practically starving and they still produce milk, right? Like your body will steal from you <laughs> in order to make the milk. So it's a little bit of both for optimal. Yes, the nutrition part, but also is baby actually transferring milk um, effectively? And that's something where there's a thousand different factors that can be at play. And so having another lactation professional to help you troubleshoot and, you know, learn this art of breastfeeding because it's, it's sure it's natural, but it doesn't always come naturally. And there's sometimes some hiccups along the way. It, it often does necessitate some, you know, expert guidance and, and support. The third and last question of the community is about iodine. And our client asks, is um, the ba baby nourished with sufficient amounts of iodine if the mother has enough, high enough levels of iodine or do I need additional foods enriched with iodine? So if you're taking in enough iodine, your milk will have enough iodine for baby. So a lot, a lot of different nutrients, not all of them, but I'd say the majority of your micronutrients, a mother's intake and nutrient stores is predictive of the nutrient levels in breast milk. I actually teach a whole like 90 minute professional webinar at the Women's Health Nutrition Academy specifically on nutrient transfer into breast milk. Iodine is one of them that is very reflective of maternal intake. Um, so If you want to know if you have enough iodine, they usually measure it by a urinary iodine um, concentration. Breastfeeding women have some of the highest iodine concentrations of the entire population, uh, along with many other nutrients, by the way. But your iodine requirements are, are nearly double what they were um, compared to a pre-pregnancy. They're also higher during pregnancy, by the way, but lactation, the highest of all. And a lot of women are low in iodine because the primary sources of iodine in the diet really are mostly sea seafood, especially seaweed. So women in uh, Asian countries that traditionally have a high seaweed intake have much better iodine status and higher iodine levels in their breast milk. Um, but if in your area, the, you know, it's primarily seafood, not much seaweed, then you're really looking at seafood, like your fish and shellfish, um, and then milk and eggs those tend to be like your top three sources for the u.s which eats like very little fish compared to some of these other countries like on average women in the u.s eat like three ounces of fish a week the primary iodine sources are actually dairy products and uh, eggs so this becomes a big problem for people following a plant-based diet who are not getting any animal foods um, unless you're eating seaweed on a fairly regular basis, you're probably pretty low. So um, typically, you know, it's recommended to continue with a prenatal vitamin postpartum. Um, I recommend it for the first six months postpartum at minimum, just to replete your nutrient stores, maintain sufficient nutrient levels in your breast milk, fill in any gaps in the diet really. Um, and that should contain iodine. Um, usually a 290 micrograms per day is what's needed for, for breastfeeding. If you're not doing that, or you just want to add additional, then seaweed would be a really excellent addition to the diet on top of your usual fish and seafood, dairy and, and eggs. And so you could do dulse flakes um, that you add along with salt. You can add kombu or wakami or other seaweed when you're making broth or cooking beans. It usually just melts down into almost nothing. Maybe you enjoy things like miso soup that have seaweed added into it or like seaweed salad. Those would all be really excellent ways to boost your iodine and you don't need massive uh, uh, portions of seaweed to get a lot of iodine. It's really quite concentrated. Um, those like nori seaweed snacks, I don't know if you have them over there. They're like sheets of nori that they're usually used to make sushi, but they also have them in like little snack size bites. Those are also a, a really good option as well. I'm so happy and thankful that you took your time to talk about that important topic today 
and uh, to help our listeners to make more healthy babies. And um, if somebody wants to dig deeper into that topic, I know that you have written some books, you have got a wonderful blog with lots of content. Where should they look for more content of you? Yeah, so first you can go to my website, lilynicholsrdn.com, and you'll have um, my blogs. There's 250 plus articles, a number of different free resources that you can download on the freebies page. I also link out to um, my books. So uh, Real Food for Pregnancy is like the, the pregnancy specific one. I have a separate one on gestational diabetes. Um, this one is available translated in German as well, which you'll probably link to. Um, the gestational diabetes one is not yet translated into German, but hopefully someday. And uh, as far as social media, you can find me on Instagram. Um, my name is the same as my website. So at Lily Nichols RDN. And yeah, I think that sums it up. Perfect. So we will link everything you mentioned in the show notes. And thanks again for having you here and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent questions. 